Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Arwain aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lintamande. Thread 4, Project Lawful and Their Oblivious Boyfriend. Episode 79. PL Timestamp. Day 6. Start. The first thing Carissa does in the morning is prepare spells. The second is track down Asmodea, who she'd meant to meet with the previous night to coordinate stories on Hell before things happened. She should probably expect that things will always happen. Asmodea has her authorized lies, but it felt yesterday like that wasn't quite enough, and the obvious explanation is that it's related to the thing where Asmodea had a message for Carissa from a dead devil. Which, in hindsight, maybe she should have asked to hear, or at least flagged as awfully important. They meet in the antechamber of the allowed to Keltham Temple, there's security at the door. What happened in hell? Not to you, I don't care if you want to relive that or not, but, uh, around you. Let's see if she can get through this without needing to invoke an authorization she doesn't yet have in hand. It seems possible that you would prefer to have this conversation someplace where only the two of us will hear it. Asmodia says, Understood. She waves the security out of the room. I woke up next to my contract devil. He finished reading his books and eventually got around to questioning me. Said that it would be a flaw in the structure of hell, I forget his exact words, if he wasn't allowed to know anything that I knew. And if that resulted in him being suddenly promoted, so be it. And if somebody destroyed him for being promoted too high, so be it. I started by giving him the broad outline, Keltham, what Keltham knows, what the knowledge might mean, Nethys giving Iona book powers, Pilar being made Caden Kylian's oracle, Carissa Sevar is sleeping with the queen. He didn't seem to notice any of that as important until I got to the part about Carissa Sevar, at which point he stopped in the middle of what he was doing and said, Carissa Sevar, tell me more. Asmodia will pause here, in case anybody happens to want to say something about that. I'm popular in dis, Carissa says blandly. He set me to writing down everything I remembered about our project, and then set me to copying spell diagrams, and then walked me through dis to a place I'd rather not talk about and left me there. Before he saw me off, he said, I memorized it. Tell Carissa Sevar that you are, of course, for sale at the right price, and to look up Ahuvir Dolzomaud, who holds your soul. Wait, what? Is this about the stupid thing she said to Abarco in the first moments of her new life, half on reflex, just trying not to undershoot? Can I have the other girl's souls? I'm not that rich yet, obviously, but if I think everyone else in hell is doing it wrong, then I'll have to get everyone myself and do it right, I guess. And then, he got killed? How? Two hours or so after he left me, I felt a sensation that I was told was the feeling of my contract devil dying and my soul going to whoever had the next rights for it. I was not informed of anything else. The only guesses I had were that knowledge of our project promoted him above his place and led to his destruction, or that he'd been destroyed for trying to pester you with offers. Security Advisory to Sivar Asmodia's thoughts are too sparse. She is trying not to think of something where I can hear it, and she is succeeding. Noted. How about you stop mind-reading her, then? And when that's acknowledged, after he left you where? Shit. All right. She was trying to get through without giving away this much to a security. But at this point, if anybody's reading her mind, they're going to notice how much it's going not readable. Asmodia places outside the barrier. You are not allowed to ask why my mind is unreadable. Tell literally no one. If you must talk with me, do so without notice. It was inside Dis's palace, and there were older devils there, making me do... many things. The memories are blurry. It hurt. At the very end, they put me somewhere I would recover faster, so I wouldn't be in too bad of a state when I went back. I see. She doesn't. She's confused, but she isn't sure being confused at Asmodia is a good idea. Better to wait until she has a guess, and then, do you have superpowers? But then she'd have successfully hidden them up to this point and doesn't have reason to confess now. 
Is there some secret hell's keeping from us? But obviously there are many. Did you think I ordered it? Because it had seemed like she thought that when they first talked, but Carissa couldn't bluff her way through, not that blind. Are you lying to me on hell's instructions? No. Asmodia has standard bluff for a second circle wizard student in Cheliax. The high priestess would know for sure. Carissa isn't sure. Keltham thought Asmodia would come back with superpowers, and he's been right about far too many other things he had no way to guess. Is there anything I'd be allowed to know if I swore not to tell anyone, not even the queen or the grand high priestess? Why is she asking that? Why is she putting it that way? It doesn't make sense. I... I don't understand. If Hell had instructed me to lie about something, why would you think that I'd be allowed to... Why do you think something unusual happened to me in Hell? Why does Keltham think that? Maybe it's not in my own interest that I say this, but since it seems that it might be a big security issue, I should notify you that I've figured out that you, Keltham, and the Crown all suspect that something happened to me in Hell. You suspect I was told by Hell not to talk about it. And you're asking me anyways, while promising not to tell the Queen and Grand High Priestess, and this is the sort of thing where, where I don't know who I'm supposed to report to. I know you could have good reasons. I'm not stupid. But it seems like I ought to report this to somebody. That should provide some cover if anybody does find out somehow that she sent a secret message to Gorthaclec. Keltham predicted you'd come back from hell with superpowers. The way he predicted that was weird and makes other predictions that we care about a lot. If Hell told you not to tell me something, then you shouldn't tell me. But if Hell might, under some possible set of conditions, want me to know that, then I would love to know under what conditions I get to know that, even if I don't get to know anything else. No one is reading your mind. No one is listening. I answer to the High Priestess here if you think I'm not serving Hell in this. What does she care about in this? Not whether Project Lawful makes correct decisions. Also, not whether Hell keeps its secrets from Project Lawful. There's one thing she cares about, which is finding out who she now needs to serve, or return a favor to. And she's just found out that Carissa Savar isn't the one who knows. Only Keltham knows, if anyone does. I don't have any... I'm not even sure what would count as a superpower asterisk that I know about already and am allowed to tell you about under the circumstances you describe. One thing you learn in Hell very quickly, even before they do any of what they call training, is to obey. If I was thinking what you seem to be thinking, I wouldn't ask the mortal who came back from Dis. I'd send to the palace in Dis and ask directly. You can tell them it's important to the project and that you won't tell the Queen or Grand High Priestess. Asterisk. This Taldane term literally refers to an anomalous special ability that usual members of a race-slash-class-slash-species should not have. I see. You can go. So now the question is, did she screw that up? Or rather, how badly did she screw that up? Asmodia turns and gets about halfway out of the room before she pauses and tentatively says, Am I going to... Should I be prepared to answer further questions from security or the crown? I guess we'll see what Dis has to say about that. But you don't actually strike me as an idiot, Asmodia. So I think, I hope, you wouldn't have given me that suggestion to conceal some secret that Hell has no desire for you to hide. I have no desire to get myself in that kind of trouble. Asmodia departs. Now she needs to figure out how to have a conversation with Keltham that doesn't get shut down and does not involve using her hoped-for Gorthaclec authorization in ways Gorthaclec would not approve of because it is possible to get tortured by devils outside of hell. Possibly she should just make like she's trying to investigate him for eventual dating purposes and see if that topic comes up once they're alone. Nobody would suspect that, right? That. Darina has just been teleported into Sothis, the capital of Osirian. She's new here, and curious, and not especially the sort to carefully research everything in advance, 
when she can test her own ability to just wing it. What does she see? The city of Sothis is built in a place where you'd expect an obvious city, just from seeing the planet from orbit. At the delta of an enormous river, which meets the inner sea less than 100 miles from Absalom and Opara. North, the river delta fans out into an enormous maze of swamp and canal, most of it growing crops. South, the river banks remain green and the rest is desert. The city of Sothis is also built around another notable feature, which is the enormous black glinting carcass of the colossal beetle Ulanat, one of the spawn of Rovagug, which terrorized the world nearly 10,000 years ago. The city has tall buildings as these things go, but the beetle carcass towers over them. The streets are wide and paved and dusty and crowded with vendor stalls, selling fish and grain and textiles and trinkets and remedies. It's blistering hot. She's getting some stares. It's not obvious if they're for the teleport or the ethnicity or the gender. The heat is nothing to her, nor does she need magic for that. The women about her, how are they dressed? How do they act? Are there other women adventurers among them? They are mostly wearing clothes that leave no skin showing, though that might be more about the sun than about modesty. The men are dressed similarly. They travel in groups, or with men, not alone, and constitute much less than half of the foot traffic on the street, though far from none of it. There are some adventurers, noticeable from their elaborate robes, or their indifference to the heat, or their colorful traveling companions. All of those seem to be men. Street vendors are men. Hmm. Well, if anyone politely asks her to change her appearance, there is no reason for Darina not to politely comply with the ways of the land in which she finds herself. Impolite requests will be judged on a case-by-case -case basis. Perhaps she could start by making inquiries of some place where foreign adventurers gather. Can she locate one such by eyesight? By wandering by moving in a direction where many adventurers seem to go. She could just ask for directions, of course, and if she fails, she will, for she is about another's business. But Darina would at least see where her own seeking takes her first. Towards the towering black beetle carcass, apparently. The streets are narrower, but the buildings nicer, as one walks in that direction. The goods in the storefronts are more expensive, the people are better dressed. There weren't many beggars in the streets in the place where she landed, but here there are none. The share of people who are women is falling. She passes a spectacular and architecturally impossible temple, zigzagging twenty stories into the sky, done in stone, with the veins placed just so as to make a spectacular pattern. Around the temple there are fourteen bars, six fee libraries, twelve workshops advertising different kinds of woodworking and metallurgy tools, and nine different places advertising themselves as the Academy of something or other. This seems to be where all of the adventurers gather. Nearly all, though not precisely all, of them are men. Well then, how about if she heads into whichever bar looks the highest leveled? and hence most likely to have rumors and advice suitable for a high-level adventurer. She does not partake in alcohol, but Osirian seems like the sort of place where you can find a non-alcoholic beverage, if you ask for one. Darina doesn't look like a fifth-circle wizard, particularly if she doesn't use her magic, but she's got a hell of a lawful aura for a monk. You'll have the wine? the bartender actually says to her, as if he almost never gets any other requests when she walks in. In Taldane, she looks like she'd speak it. There's a board up labeled Bounties, and another labeled Bets. Both are large, and people are gathered around them, chattering. Some of them look at Darina once, and then twice. No one approaches her while she's ordering. I fear I do not partake in alcohol, but will be happy to try whatever non-alcoholic specialty of Osirian you think worth the experience. Sure. He puts away the wine he was about to pour, which is glowing with a powerful transmutation, and crushes some lemons instead for a sugar and lemon drink, pressed to digitated cold as he hands it across the bar. We take gold, or silver, or Absalom dollars. If you've anything rarer, you'll have to trade it at the temple. How long left on the wine? Someone asks him while he's preparing her drink. An hour. 
she spread seven gold and silver pieces upon the counter, drawn from as many different widely separated countries. Your preference. Here from a long way away, hmm? In that case, I should pitch you on the wine. There's a spell of the second circle, quite simple, that transmutes ordinary liquid to wit-sharpening wine. Not as good as a headband, but good for applying the smarts you've already got in ways you might not have thought of, for doing research or solving a puzzle or finishing something, when you know you will think of the answer eventually, you just haven't yet. It's a weak spell, normally, and doesn't last long, but cast by the most powerful mage in all the inner sea, Nefreti Klepati, at our very own Temple of the All-Seeing Eye. It lasts more than three hours, an hour left, on this batch, which you get a discount for, and the effect is much, much more powerful. I know people who say they'd take it over a headband, if you could bottle it in a headband, which you can't. The lemonade will be a third of the weight of this coin here, and the wine about a full coin. Advice is free, if you're new in town. Hmm. Perhaps I shall prove to have need of the wine. But I would as soon challenge my current problem with just my natural wits first. She slides the full coin across the counter to him. Take the full coin for the lemonade. I am indeed seeking advice. And if you say that it is free for one new in town, well, give an extra helping of advice someday to someone who isn't on me. Darina sips the drink and finds it nothing surprising. It tastes like how you'd expect it to taste, given how it was made. Refreshing, perhaps, but not enlightening. Most experiences are not. I am sent to this land on something of an unusual mission, bearing information that is needful to a group of gamblers or some such, but pursuing that as a calling, and not for profit alone, aspiring to slice the finest odds upon their bets that mortals may set. These gamblers will be associated with the god Abadar, perhaps clerics of his church or answerable to such. Where would I go seeking to find someone who could tell me about which such groups might exist in Osirion? If there is only one such, my answer is already found. Sure sounds like something in the church, sir, and I expect they'd know. Or you could talk to the man who sets the numbers on the bounties when he comes by, because he must employ at least one of them if he isn't one himself. He comes by most mornings, though not all of them. Sometimes none of the numbers have much changed. I'd as soon not dawdle about my... about his way, if the bounty setter is not here, and not known to be here soon. I will inquire of Abadar's church, if you believe they would know. What bounties are these of which you speak? The church does all kinds of things, but most of interest to adventurers, they do death insurance. And if you go and die insured, they'll run a bounty for someone to bring your body in, to save them the fancier kind of diamond on the resurrection. So they post dead people, and the bounties, and their estimates of how likely someone is to succeed at bringing them in. Though, of course, if you're very good, your odds will be higher, and if you're very lousy, they'll be lower. But it's useful to know which ones are chasing fish in the sea and which ones are solid money. Money is long since meaningless to her, who bears no magic arms nor magic armor, and uses magic items only as an admission of temporary failure. Darina regularly donates excess wealth to some good cause or another, and does some needful act. Phrasma calls evil to restore the balance, if she finds her alignment shifting. Not my calling at this moment, but I admit, I do not see the connection between that and the gamblers I am to seek. Not much of the church where you're from, huh? I know well enough that Abadar's church acts as a bank in many places, but I have little use for banks. If I have so much money I can no longer carry it about myself, it is time to give some away. As suits you, I suppose. Anyway, I'm not a religious, but it's all the same currency, information, and money. The insurance company, when they notice someone's gone and died, has to guess how much trouble it'll be to return their body, to set the bounty. If they're bad at guessing then they're going to set the bounty too high or too low and lose money next to an insurance company run by people who know how to count and they've been at it a while so they're not bad at guessing and no one would take a bounty from a place that didn't guess or didn't tell you their guess it's gambling but not to win some copper off your friends and if you win then in the long run everyone wins 
Because death insurance is cheaper, and this pack of fools can go out and do more dangerous stuff. An interesting way. I do not think I have fully grasped it from your description alone. The people I am seeking, no doubt, have understood it much better. She finishes her lemonade, sets down the empty glass. Where may I find such a church of Abadar as would be able to guide my next steps? Here in Southeast, practically every street corner, the nice symmetrical buildings with the golden doors and the symbol of Abadar on them. You don't think it worth trying a larger one or some particular one? From your description, I don't know if your information is something they'll buy at the first temple you come to, or something for some very secret group of people who bet on spies or something like that. But if it's the latter, you'd want the temple in the Black Dome, and you can't get into the Black Dome without a recommendation. So either way, you might as well start at the first temple you come to. Someone else comes up, wanting wine. He pours it for them. She is already curious as to what silly thing she shall have to do to earn a recommendation to the Black Dome's temple, but she is perhaps getting ahead of herself. I'll be on about the way then, she says, and departs. She will enter the first temple of Abadar that she comes to, as instructed. It's clean and busy. There's a line of people waiting for service at a polished stone counter, and a teenage boy scrubbing the polished stone floors, and a teenage girl carrying boxes of records back and forth from the counter and up the stairs to the next floor. There's a sizable altar beyond the front room where people are laying candles and burning incense, but it's not at all the focal point of the space. Down some narrow stairs there's a glimpse of a classroom, full of boys who are age five to ten or so. She shall inquire, then, of the teenage boy scrubbing the floors. Where can she find a cleric of Abadar to guide a foreign traveler bearing information for one's pursuing gambling as a great calling? Or just a cleric of Abadar, if that seems overly specific? There's a cleric on staff here. The price of her time is six silver for a quarter hour, after which she'll quote a more specific price for further questions in the same vein. Her specialty isn't gambling, but she'd probably know whose specialty is. Silliness. But silver is meaningless to her. If this is how Abadar's clerics choose to conduct themselves about his business, that is between their own selves and Abadar, and none of her proper concern. Well then, Darren shall go and pay six silver to consult one of Abadar's for a quarter hour. The cleric is younger than her and veils her face, and wears a fairly absurd amount of jewellery. She's cheerful enough, though. What can I help you with? Most people are younger than her, in fact. I am sent to this land bearing information for certain people who are of interest to Abadar, perhaps his clerics, or answerable to such. They are gamblers excelling in their art and aspiring to excel more yet slicing their odds as finely as a blade's edge or a hair's width. They are considering a question of some importance. The one who sent me wishes for them to have information pertinent to it. How may my steps be guided onward to find those I seek? Ah, sent by who, may I ask? Someone of some importance. Forgive me but I would avoid speaking too much of such details until I have gone as far as I possibly can without speaking those details, that they not be spread wider than the people I am seeking would themselves desire. I understand. Almost every decision of importance in Osirian is made by gambling, as you would call it. It focuses the mind to make predictions in numbers it is accustomed to, and coin is a number in which we are all accustomed to reasoning, with the additional useful property of rewarding those who reason well. Different ones ask different questions. Our great merchant houses gamble in ships, and our great adventuring companies, in the lives of those who purchase their protection, and our census-takers, in the numbers of our people, and the yields of their fields. It would be difficult to direct you, with no idea of what your question touches on. I am reluctant to call the matter important, since, in my experience, what great palaces and temples think to be important 
is often different from what is actually important, and I have no desire to find myself before royalty accused of wasting their time. Again, still, the matter strikes me as one more important than merchant ships and granaries. Are you the one who should dispatch me about that, or should I visit another? Who knows all these gamblers better before I can go no further along the way without speaking? I can refer you to one senior in the church. And with a recommendation, they charge their fee directly to Abadar, if that is how you see the value running. On so little information, I would hesitate to refer you to the dome, which is where the contracts run most finely, and on the matters of the greatest importance. The dome cannot be scried through, and in fact, no spell can go through it at all, and so matters that ought not to be known are spoken of there. And it is the seat of the pharaoh, who is Abadar in Golarion. Has your time been compensated? What would you charge us for it? To have honestly earned any reward from the one who sent me, by my own strength and in a matter of his true need, is all that I ask. The fees Abadar's clerics ask strike me as strange, but if they are within my ability to pay, I will pay them myself and not concern myself with who else should. I am given this task. I accepted it. I will complete it myself. I will visit your senior. Let them decide whether to send me on to this dome. Perhaps my quest lies within. Perhaps not. I can accompany you if you have no travelling companion. They will not agree to meet you alone, and your matter is secret. It is not necessary that I hear you speak of it. She pulls a bag off her wall and puts it over her shoulder. How would you have the priest decide which petitions to answer? Darina will follow where she is led, if she is being led. I have never given the matter much thought before. Religions of good seem to have their priests judging urgent needs and answering them. Priests of evil, of course, answer petitions according to how it serves their own purposes or the spread of their particular sickness. Chaotic neutral would decide at random, perhaps, I admit I have never brought a petition before such. Nethys's priests would like you to be clever enough, knowledgeable enough, before they deign to speak to you. On the lawful neutral side of things, a priest of Aurori is something of a contradiction in terms, but they sometimes seem to think that asking petitioners to prove their strength or judgment to them is somehow meaningful. I think they are silly, but then they are engaged about a silly profession. She has told the apprentice her whereabouts and set off down the street towards the dome again. It seems to me that the ideal, even were one good, would be to answer the petitions that are the most important, that touch on the greatest costs or the greatest benefits, and where the advice is more sorely needed and likeliest to be listened to. And when people pay for advice, they demonstrate that they expect the advice to inform a decision of great weight and that they intend to listen to it. I am not good, but if I were, my price would be the same, I think, if my gains distributed differently. I should sooner expect that it results in advice and aid being given entirely to those who need it least, if their need is to be the argument. Oh? You imagine that the rich have little need of counsel, because their judgment is so good, or their decision so inconsequential or because they will not listen to it. Because their decisions are inconsequential. To the extent their decisions are consequential, they will not listen. To the extent such a one is humble enough to listen on consequential matters, I would not expect the advice they purchase from an advice seller to be better than their own judgment. But perhaps I am too cynical, having wandered so much of Galarian beyond the paradise that Osirion must be with so much excellent advice for sale. The ones who will not listen do not purchase. People listen to counsel that was expensive for them, and they seek it out 
only when they judge it worth the cost. But it is a fair complaint that the system, if it is better, should have proved itself, and hasn't yet, though the church is new in its strength, and the country new to its independence. And I do not doubt that Abadar will change our path, if this one does not make us as wealthy as it is expected to. They round a corner and approach a bigger, lovelier temple of Abadar. This one set right against the walls of the Black Dome. It's even more impressive in person, more than a hundred feet tall, not properly black, but iridescent like the carapace of an enormous beetle which it is. So you'll prove your way, given some little time? To that I have no answer but my willingness and desire to witness it. She'll gawk at the black dome without trying to conceal anything of how impressed she is. To pretend to be jaded is far beneath her dignity. Some day, if she's good enough, and practices long enough, and walks her way maybe further than Irori ever did, she may be able to kill something like that. Ulunat, the firstborn of Rovagug, says her guide, slain by the first pharaoh. It is said that magic behaves strangely within its shell, more powerful for those who know how to wield it, but useless to those who don't. They ascend the temple steps. And if the laws of Osirion don't make us the richest of all lands, then they were the wrong laws. The purpose of the laws is to bring plenty to those who work for it. This bank has several counters, and the staff person at one of them beckons them. This woman has come on strange business, for which I have referred her to a senior priest. She'll pay their fee if having heard the business, they think it correct to charge it to her. How much do you prefer an answer at once to an answer tomorrow? The staff person asks Dorina. I prefer it at once. Yes, but how much? She said her coin holds little meaning for her. Do you not want things you can purchase with money? I suppose now and then I must replace some item I have failed badly enough to use. But for the most part, no. It accumulates until I give it away. She takes a small handful of platinum from about herself, not bothering to count the coins. I am reluctant to spend all I have in this very moment, in case I must play further rounds of this silly game. But I think at least this much I would like to see haste and seriousness. Understood, he says, and runs off up the stairs. I don't see why, says her guide. It is a failure to solve a problem with a tool you have at hand. You have answered your own question. Money is a tool for solving problems, one that blunts as it is used and comes to be expended. I prefer to solve problems with myself, for I grow sharper as I am used, nor have I yet found the limit of that as a resource. The man comes running back downstairs. He'll see you now. You'll accompany he adds to her guide. Oh, of course. She can guess at a reason for that, but to the extent it's true, it also renders their opinions on the subject meaningless. And she will follow in the next footsteps that are pointed out to her. This priest is an old man with rich robes who rises to greet her. Stranger, I was not told your name. It's not entirely impossible that somebody would recognize it. Are our words now, for your ears and mine alone? That can be done. He pours something into the torch on his wall to do it. The other cleric sits across the room, outside the sudden radius of golden light the torch now casts. I am Darina, sent hence upon an errand by one greater than myself. I bear information for gamblers who aspire to be the greatest in their art which I thought would be more of a helpful distinction than it has proven to be in Sothis. Whether these aspiring gamblers may be found within the Black Dome or beyond it is not a thing known to me. The matter strikes me as one that is probably important, but I have often found myself disagreeing with royalty about what is probably important. The gamblers are related to the god Abadar, they may be his clerics, or answer to his clerics. 
If that is not enough information to send me upon my way, I'd have your oath as Abadar's cleric, not to repeat what else I must then say. Are there gamblers who don't aspire to be the greatest in their art, he says. But give me a moment. And he considers. You have my oath not to repeat what further you have to say to me, or to deliberately share that which would permit another to derive it, and to defer to you on questions of discretion relevant to this oath, while you are available, and to my understanding of your wishes, if you are not. These matters, then, does it concern? A goddess whose purpose is hidden, a place where the gods may not intervene, a woman of Cheliax, a priest of Abadar who should not be where he is, a torment unmade, a compact upon a compact upon a soul. Does that suffice for you to know for whom among Abadar's gamblers this information must be meant? Yes, it does. It is for those who are learning to use money to rebuild the shredded threads of fate that Abadar can see again. It is for the Prince Merenre. I can take you there. I, to be clear, do vouch for the accuracy of what I have said about the subject matter, but not that it is in fact of interest to this prince. If that is understood, Leed and I will follow after. Darina has fought her way out of three palaces in her life, and she thought to herself that she was failing to learn from experience after the second one. That is understood. He departs his office through a back door and trots off. Not very quickly, he's an old man, but evidently quickly for the amount of cooperation he has from his joints, down the back stairs. I do not think the Prince Merenre will disappoint you, or you, him. The back door is guarded. The priest speaks in a low voice with the guards. Her intentions. Weapons. Chaperone. Then they stand aside, and on opposite sides of the door press patterns into the wall, and the door opens into the dome. It is cool inside Ulunat's corpse. The air does not feel stale, but crisp and refreshing, the feel of a breeze despite the absence of any actual breeze. There's the faint scent of summer wildflowers. The sun is visible in the sky, through illusion or perhaps some partial transparency in the beetle's carapace. It is not quite as bright as it ought to be, and the sky around it is a spectacular black purple. The buildings here are very rich and very lovely, and there are as many women as men. At one end of the dome is a spectacular white stone palace, rising all several hundred feet to the purple-black sky, surrounded by stunningly lush gardens. There they head. Her new guide does not speak further. Silence is not troublesome to her. She will look about at the buildings and the sky. As for the white stone palace, from Darina's own perspective, its beauty is somewhat tinged with melancholia. The guards at the door stop them, but only apparently to take their message to the prince and give them directions. And then they are escorted through the first floor of the palace, all pillars and fountains and silk sheets in the place of proper walls, up some marble stairs to the second floor where there's a sumptuous meeting room and a woman priest, there to chaperone. She is clothed as the male priest, which is notable only because the women visible in the distance as they were escorted here were wearing half-transparent gauze dresses and a great deal of gold jewelry. Here I may leave, her guide says, or stay, if you would rest more easily knowing I will tell Prince Merenre, when he arrives, that we are here on my authority, and my conviction he'd wish to see you urgently. Do as you deem best to serve your god's purposes here. If somehow there's any question, refer the prince to the priest Senusret for clarifications, says the priest, and departs. Pleased to meet you, the woman says. I have no qualifications for this business, but can call in refreshments if you'd like something to eat or drink. Thank you. I believe I shall manage. To save some little time, perhaps, I will ask now what arrangements have been made that you not hear what must be only for Prince Merenre's ears. She taps her earrings. Without these, I am deaf. That would hardly stop me if I wished to comprehend a conversation, but I take it the rest is meant to rely on trust. Prince Merenre will offer such assurances as you might require, but even without them, it would be a wrong against Abadar in his own house 
to aim to eavesdrop on one who came for a private conference because they happened to ask for the wrong set of assurances. We're not Cheliacs. The name is said with contempt and annoyance and some sadness. No, you are not, though that is a rather lax standard to which to hold oneself. Still, I take your meaning well enough. Darina is content to wait in silence for Marenre if this woman is. If you wish to support this AI reading and others like it, please visit patreon.com slash AI. Any help is appreciated. And thank you to executive producer John Doe 7776059. Thank you.